Silent Witch. Vol 1, Entrance Preparation Arc. Monica Everett, who had been lying asleep on her desk with a pen in her right hand and a stack of papers in her left, woke up to the morning light streaming in through the window. Apparently, she had left the curtains open and fallen asleep again. It is always the case that when you are absorbed in calculations, the details of daily life become neglected. The fact that she had forgotten to close the curtains meant that she had been absorbed in her work from before the sun went down until she fell asleep yesterday. As she lazily sat up and rubbed her eyes, she noticed a thread of ink on the side of her hand. She put her hand to her cheek, wondering what it might be, and a boisterous voice sounded from above her head. Monica, you're in trouble. There's a weird pattern appearing on your face. It must be the curse of the dark dragon. Anyone who suffers from this curse will have those cursed patterns spread all over their body and they will die after lying around for three days and three nights. I saw it written in a book I read the other day. Monica moved her eyes, still sleepily, looked up at the owner of the boisterous voice. Glittering golden eyes gazed down at Monica on the ceiling beams where the sunlight never reached. Blinking a few times, she could vaguely see the outline of a black cat blending into the darkness. Nero, you know, this isn't a curse or anything. Monica lifted the paper she was halfway through writing the formula on and brought it up to her face level. Holding the paper next to her cheek, the same pattern laid out as if it were a mirror image. I just fell asleep lying on top of a formula I was writing, and this is just some ink on my face. When Monica waved the formula paper in the air, Nero, the black cat who had been looking down on her from the ceiling beam, nimbly jumped onto the desk. Nero wasn't just a black cat. He was Monica's familiar and understood human language. He also recently learned to read, so while Monica was engrossed in her formula he would spend his time reading entertaining novels. Nero looked up at Monica from the desk and said rudely, You are such an idiot. Actually, the curse of the dark dragon can be lifted with a kiss from the fairy prince. Shall I try it out on you? You are not a fairy, Nero. M.M. I'm going to wash my face. Going around the back of the house, Monica moved her small body diligently to draw water from the well. Recently, the development of plumbing technology has been making significant progress and not only in the big cities but also in the villages around here. However, this cabin located in the middle of the mountain was, as expected, not equipped with tap water. Monica, who had grown up in the city, found it inconvenient at first, but lately, she had gotten used to living in the mountains. The best thing is that it's quiet and uncrowded. After getting a tub of water for drinking, Monica went back inside the cabin and looked at the figure in the corner of the room as if she had just remembered. Someone had told her to mind her appearance a little bit, and she had been forced to bring in a dresser, which was quite magnificent for this shabby hut. Unlike mirrors made of polished bronze, this beautiful mirror was made of tinned glass not to mention its size was of a full-length mirror, which is a very expensive item. If a thief were to break into this cabin, this mirror would be the first thing he would take. In such a splendid mirror, the image shown was of a skinny, petite girl with shaggy hair. Compared to her actual age of 17, her poor body was pale and looked like a dead person. Her light brown hair, plaited in two, was dry and shabby, more coarse than a bundle of straw. Her eyes, underneath her overgrown bangs, were covered with dark circles. Now that she thought about it, she realized that she hadn't slept at all the night before last. At least she needs a cup of coffee to clear her head. Monica took a can of coffee beans from her desk, which was buried in a stack of papers, and coarsely poured them into the mill. Making sure that the scale was set to fine grind, Monica turned the handle around and around. Amused by the scene, 
Nero jumped up on the desk and looked at her. I have always wondered why people with weak stomachs want to eat so many strange foods. Those beans are the ones you roast until they turn black, right? They are very bitter, aren't they? Do they taste good? It's delicious. With that, Monica took out a metal pot. The teapot was longer and narrower than most teapots, and it split in two at the center. First, pour water into the lower part of the pot, which is divided into upper and lower parts, then set a funnel with a metal filter on top of it. Put the finely ground coffee beans in there until they become powdery, and set the top of the pot firmly on the bottom. Monica lifted the pot and looked at the poorly constructed stone fireplace. With just that, a thin fire blazed inside the stove. The unnaturally long and thin fire, unlike the fire that was ignited by a tinder made of wood, was the result of spell. Monica put the metal pot on the fire and took some nuts out of the cupboard and popped them into her mouth. There were very few nuts left in the preserved food. Since it is now the end of summer, the forest will be full of nuts in another month. Once that happens, she could ask Nero to help her pick some nuts. As she was absent-mindedly thinking about this, the metal pot which was on the fire made a gurgling sound. Monica put out the fire with one look and poured the contents of the pot into a tin mug. Here in the Ridile Kingdom, coffee is not a very common drink. There are a few coffee houses in the capital, but they are basically for men to enjoy. Women do not like coffee very much. They generally prefer black tea. Monica likes to drink coffee because of her late father's influence. This special metal pot was also specially made by her father, who had asked a craftsman to make it for her. Now, it is a treasured memento of her father. Monica huffed and puffed into the tin mug and sipped at its contents. Although the bitterness is strong, the coffee is brewed in a short time and has a clean taste without any bitterness. The best thing about it is that it helps her awaken from her drowsiness. Monica, I'd like to try some of that too. Nero scurried around the desk, begging Monica for coffee. Monica dribbled some of the coffee that was left at the bottom of the cup onto a spoon and placed it in front of Nero. She shouldn't give coffee to cats, but Nero is not a normal cat, so it will be fine, perhaps. You just said it was bitter. You know, any creature that forgets its sense of adventure would make them goes on degenerating. That's what the book said. Oh, I like Dustin Gunther a lot. Nero licked the coffee off his spoon as he mentioned the name of a novelist who was popular in the capital. As soon as he did, all the hair on his body stood on end. Hanji Arababo. Nero let out a mewling sound that neither human nor cat would have made and rolled around on the desk. As expected, it didn't suit his tongue. Nero let out a ragged breath like a warrior who has just returned from the dead and looked up into Monica's face. It tasted too stimulating for my adventurous taste buds. Your taste buds must be crazy to be able to drink this. Milk and sugar would have made it easier to drink, but both of those are precious in this mountain. Monica suddenly remembered that today was the day she was supposed to have her monthly supplies delivered. Monica, who is very shy and does not like to go shopping in stores, has been asking people from the village at the foot of the mountain to deliver food and other supplies to her. One of those items could be milk. As for sugar, it was impossible to get refined white sugar, but they may share honey with you if you ask for it. Beekeeping is very popular in this region, and honey is relatively easy to get. The combination of honey and coffee is a matter of taste, but it would probably suit Nero's taste better. With these thoughts in mind, there was a knock at the door of the cabin as she was washing the pot. Monica, I'm here to deliver your goods. You got a visitor. Guess I'll be pretending to be a cat. Meow. Okay. Nodding to Nero, Monica opened the door with trepidation. There was a card in front of the door, 
and a girl of about 10 years old was standing in front of it. She is a feisty looking girl with dark brown hair tied behind her neck. She is a girl from a village near here, and her name is Annie. This girl was the one who delivered the goods to Monica. Monica peeked out a little from behind the door and said, H hello, with a jittery look on her face. Annie was used to Monica's attitude, and after unloading the goods from the cart, she pushed Monica away and opened the door. Let's get your stuff inside. You can help me with the door. Oh okay. Monica gave a small, jittery nod, and Annie briskly carried the goods inside. The cabin where Monica lives has very little furniture, but the table and floor are cluttered with stacks of papers and books, and there is no place to step. Her bed was already filled with papers, and she couldn't even lie down on it. That's why Monica had recently made it a habit to sleep on a chair. Your house is terrible as usual? So tell me, is this bundle of paper important? Should I throw it away? A all of them is important. Annie looked at the stack of papers occupying the floor with suspicious eyes. Hey, these are formulas, right? What exactly are you trying to calculate? Annie can read, and being the daughter of a craftsman, she is good with numbers. She is only a little over 10 years old, but she is a smart girl compared to other children her age. Even for Annie, it seemed that what was written here was just a series of numbers that she could not understand. Monica turned over and answered while avoiding eye contact with Annie. Well, that one, is a formula for calculating the orbits of stars. Then what's this? It's got a lot of plant names on it. It is, for calculates and tabulates the fertilizer mix for plants. Then how about this? Are those magic letters? Somehow it's kind of similar to it. I it was a new formula for a complex spell that was proposed by Professor Minerva. Annie's eyes widened as she fiddled with the sleeves of her bulky robe and whispered back to Monica. Spell formula? You can use spellcraft, Monica. Um, well, that's... Monica stammered, her gaze wandering left and right. Nero who was pretending to be asleep on the shelf, meowed as if to say, Hey, hey, are you okay? When Monica was forever fidgeting and kneading her fingers, Annie lightly coughed and laughed. Of course, there's no way you could use spellcraft. If you could use it, you wouldn't be living in seclusion in the mountains, but working in the capital instead. Spellcraft by using some method, it can achieve some phenomenon to create miracles. It used to be a secret technique monopolized by the aristocracy, but in recent years, the common people have been given the opportunity to learn it. Even so, to enter an academy to learn spellcraft, you need to have a certain amount of wealth or talent, and it's not something that anyone can easily learn. If someone from the common people had become a magician, that would be considered a big success. For example, a senior magician can get a job in the magical corps, which is the most popular type of magician. And a mid-level magician or higher can work for a specialized institution for magic research or as a servant for a noble family. Even if one were to live as a researcher, it would be natural to conduct research in a place with splendid facilities in the royal capital not in a shabby cabin deep in the mountains like this. Annie was right in pointing out that Monica, who lived in a cabin deep in the mountains, could not possibly be a magician. Hey, have you heard, Monica? Three months ago, the eastern border was attacked by a dragon. Monica's shoulders twitched under her cape, and Nero, who had been pretending to be asleep on the shelf, opened one eye. Nero's tail, dangling slackly beneath the shelf, swished like the pendulum of a clock. A large number winged dragon has appeared in a flock in the village. I heard there were more than ten of them. As the name suggests, the winged dragon is a dragon with wings. They are a lower-ranking species of the dragon with low intelligence, but they are very formidable in packs. 
They often target livestock, but in the past few years, it has not been uncommon for starving winged dragons to attack humans. And then, and then, the one who was leading that group of winged dragons was a legendary black dragon, the infamous black dragon of Wagon. Among dragons, those titled with a color in their names are called the higher species and are considered especially dangerous. The most dangerous of them all is the black dragon. The special flame breathed out by the black dragon, the black flame, is a forbidden flame that mercilessly burns through the defensive boundaries of high-ranking magicians. Once the black dragon goes on a rampage, it is not surprising that the country will turn into scorched earth. Truly, a dangerous creature worthy of legend. So, I heard that the dragon knights went to defeat the black dragon, and one of them was accompanied by one of the seven sages? Oh, you know what the seven sages are? They're the top seven magicians in this country. Anyway, they're amazing magicians. H. Ha, the youngest of the seven sages, the silent witch, she single-handedly shot down all the winged dragons and not only that, but she also killed the black dragon of Wagon. For a rural village, this kind of gossip is a valuable form of entertainment. Annie's eyes were already sparkling with excitement, but Monica was far from it. To be honest, she felt like throwing up a little. The Silent Witch is the only magician in existence who uses chantless spell. Normally, chanting is required for spellcraft, but the Silent Witch doesn't need to chant at all. She can use powerful magic without chanting. Monica silently held her stomach which was hurt as if it was being squeezed. Even though it was a pleasant early summer morning, Monica was drenched in sweat all over. I wish I could see them just once. The real seven sages. In the countryside like this, it's rare to see a magician, let alone one of the seven sages. That's probably why Annie has something close to longing for a magician. Holding her aching stomach, Monica pulled a leather bag from the shelf and took out a few silver coins from it. She took out a few silver coins from the leather bag, which she used to pay for the goods brought to her and to pay Annie's wages. Tea thanks for, a always, bringing me tea these goods. Thanking her, Monica placed the silver coin in Annie's hand. Annie counted the number of silver coins and tilted her head. You're giving me this much as usual? That's almost twice the amount of goods you have here. As since you're delivering it to me, you can keep the extra, as your allowance, Annie. Most children would have been happy to put the coins in their pockets, but Annie was a smart girl. Annie looked up at Monica with probing eyes at the undeserved reward. What kind of a job does Monica do? Um, accounting. You're a professor of mathematics. I guess, it's, something, like that, yeah. The piles of documents filed in here were all distinct. In addition to the orbits of the stars and the blending of fertilizers, there are all kinds of data on demographics, tax revenues, product sales, and all sorts of other numbers that are lined up in this cabin in a seemingly disorderly fashion according to an order that only Monica can understand. Annie seemed to be reasonably satisfied with the a professor of mathematics explanation. Hmm, so the person who came to our village yesterday is also a professor of mathematics. Huh. Someone who said he was your colleague came to our village. He wanted to go to your house, so I gave him directions. I'm sure he'll be here soon. Colleague. At that comment, Monica's face paled. Monica asked Annie in a muffled voice, her body shaking beneath her oversized robe. W.W. What kind of person? I, 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 I is he. It's me. A clear voice rang out behind Monica. Monica's throat hitched. When she turned around, there was a beautiful man with lustrous chestnut hair in braids, leaning against the door and smiling. Beside him was a blonde beauty in a maid's uniform. The man is wearing a fine frock coat, 
a walking stick, and a pair of glasses. From every angle, he looks like a refined and elegant man. Above all, he had a thin, feminine face that would make most women swoon. But as though Monica had encountered an evil dragon, she peeled her eyes open and desperately swallowed her scream. A A A A A A Lo 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 Louis is San. He eek. Can you please not make up funny names for people like Lo 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 Louis? He eek. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The man smiled at Annie, not paying attention to the half-frozen Monica. He then took the girl's hand and placed a candy bar on it. Thanks for showing me the way and being so helpful, young lady. It's my pleasure. Annie smiled and gave a ladylike bow to the beautiful young man, and tossed a candy bar into her pocket. Okay, I don't want to interrupt your work, so I'll be going now. Bye bye, Monica. See you in a month. With that, Annie left the hut, her gait more ladylike than usual. As she listened hopelessly to the rattle of the cart pulling away, Monica looked up at the man in front of her with tears in her eyes. He mimics himself with a frock coat and a walking stick, but he is really a magician wearing a long robe and cloak and clutching a magnificent staff. The beautiful woman in a maid's uniform behind him is his contracted spirit. I it's been a while. Louis San. Once she greeted him in a shaky voice, Louis placed his right hand on his chest and bowed gracefully. Yes, it's been a while. One of the seven sages the silent witch, Miss Monica Everett. V1C2, the end of Monica's happy slow life. As Roth GT Silent Witch April 15, 2021 13 minutes. What is the difference between magic and spellcraft? This is a basic problem that any aspiring magician will see at least once in their life. To put it simply, magic is making some phenomenon happen by exercising mana, while spellcraft is achieving that phenomenon by using a method and the method of using mana can be called a spell. A spell refers to exercising mana by weaving a magical formula through chanting. In the first place, magic is not the exclusive domain of humans. Spirits, dragons, and the now endangered species known as magical beasts and demons also can manipulate mana. They are born with a natural ability to manipulate mana, so they do not need to go through the process of weaving a formula. That's why chanting is not necessary. For example, dragons, depending on their species, can fly freely in the sky and breath fire from their mouths. Both of these phenomena are caused by mana, but do dragons bother to chant when they fly or breathe fire? The answer is no. Dragons do not need chanting because their race is proficient in manipulating mana. So, only humans, the only beings who cannot use magic without composing a magic formula by chanting. In short, humans unable to use magic without chanting. However, there is one genius girl who made the impossible possible. Her name is Monica Everett. A shy girl who can't talk to people properly and has shut herself away deep in the mountains, and one of the seven sages, the silent witch. Spellcraft can be classified into three categories, advanced, intermediate, and lower level, with advanced spell taking 20 to 30 seconds, intermediate spell taking 10 to 20 seconds, and lower level spell generally taking 3 to 10 seconds to chant. While not every magic formula, Monica can perform about 80% of the techniques without chanting. The biggest weakness of magicians is that they become defenseless while chanting. So, it goes without saying that the time spent chanting can be the difference between life and death on the battlefield. Some advanced magicians use shortened chanting, quick spell, to cut their chanting time in half, but even so, Monica is the only one who can do chantless, no spells. That's why, two years ago, at the mere age of 15, Monica Everett was chosen as one of the seven sages, 
the highest level of magicians in the country. This is a very simple and straightforward story of how such a genius girl came to master Chantless spell. Being extremely bashful and shy, Monica was unable to speak properly in public. It's still better when she's dealing with Annie, but when she's in front of someone she didn't know or the type of person she didn't like, she would become so convulsed that she couldn't even speak. In the worst case, she would either throw up or collapse. Of course, chanting was something she would never be able to do. At the time, Monica was on the verge of dropping out of school after failing her practical exam due to her inability to chant. Then Monica thought about it. She was too nervous to chant in front of the examiner. Then, why can't she just use her magic without chanting? Normally, she would have tried to overcome her shyness and aggression, but Monica's ideas took off in a completely different direction, and to everyone's surprise, her talent blossomed. And so, for a rather trivial and not at all inspiring reason, Monica mastered the chantless spell and became one of the seven sages in no time at all. Indeed, her effort has completely ended in an unexpected direction. Calming her shaking hands, Monica made the coffee using the same procedure as in the morning and placed it gently in front of her guest. Pee pee please h have a d drink. That's an unusual extraction method, isn't it? Thanks for the drink. The beautiful looking guest sat down on the chair Monica had prepared for him while sipping his coffee. As for his maid, she was standing behind him. His thin eyebrows furrowed and his purple-gray eyes glared at Monica behind his spectacles. This bitter coffee seems to have been boiled down with malice, is meant to harass me. He eek, I I I I am SSS I. I've traveled a long way to the depths of the mountains, and now I'm being treated like this. Isn't this just a bit excessive? This man, who is a co-worker of Monica, is also one of the seven sages. His name was Lewis Miller, the barrier magician. He was 27 years old, 10 years older than Monica, but since he became one of the seven sages at the same time as Monica, he often got the same treatment as her. Lewis was a handsome man who looks delicate when he's not talking, but he is also an extremely fierce magician who boasts the second highest record for killing dragons alone. He has also served as the leader of the Magic Corps and was feared by the members of the Corps for his shrewdness. Anyway, it would be horrible to make him angry, so when Monica placed the glass of water in front of Louis, she was trembling with fear. You um, M may I a ask what why your business is tea today? Lewis took a sip from his glass of water and turned his attention to the woman in the maid's uniform standing behind him. Lynn, put up a soundproof barrier. Certainly. The moment the maid called Lynn nodded her head, the sounds in the area around the cabin suddenly disappeared. The sound of the wind, birds singing, and all other sounds from the outside are isolated from the inside of the cabin. Nero, who was pretending to be asleep on the shelf, shivered his beard uncomfortably and looked at the woman in the maid's uniform with golden eyes. She was a tall, slender, beautiful woman. However, her well-formed face was expressionless and somewhat doll-like. The reason why she was able to set up a ward without chanting was, precisely that she was not a human but a high-ranking spirit. There were only about ten magicians in the whole kingdom who have high-ranking spirits as their followers. In other words, having a high-ranking spirit as your follower was a kind of status for a magician. Miss Monica, why don't you make a contract with a high-ranking spirit? I think that would help you gain some credibility. I, I have, A already got an excellent familiar with me. Nero on the shelf wagged his tail nodding his head in approval. Lewis took one look at Nero on the shelf and snickered as if he had noticed Nero's presence. It's quite a cute little familiar. At his somewhat mocking murmur, Nero made a clear meow sound. Well, 
Anyway, let's get down to business. I've come here today to ask you for a favor. A a favor. When Monica made no attempt to hide her wariness, Louis smiled graciously, crossed his white gloved hands, and rested his chin on them. Yes, actually, I've been guarding the second prince in secret for the past month under the orders of his majesty. Huh. Louis's words made Monica widen her eyes. In this country, there were three princes with different mothers. Prince Lionel, who was 27 years old, Prince Felix, who was 18 years old, and Prince Albert, who was 14 years old as to which of the three would become the next king. The nobles in the country have different perspectives. Monica was not interested in this kind of power struggle, so she only knew about it from what she heard from others, but according to rumors, the first and second prince factions were almost equal in number, and the third prince faction was slightly outnumbered. Among the seven sages, there were those from the first prince faction and those from the second prince faction. And this barrier magician, Lewis Miller, was a prime example of the first prince faction. So why was that Lewis has been ordered to guard the second prince? Monica's eyebrows furrowed in discomfort. You um, Louis San, you're, from the first prince's faction, aren't, you? Yes, so why did his majesty give me an order to become the second prince's personal guard? I have some thoughts about it, but it would be inappropriate to speculate about his majesty's will, so let's not do that here. What's important is that his majesty ordered me to protect the second prince without being noticed. Not to mention how difficult it is to protect a person without the target noticing. Why did the king give an order to Louis, a member of the first prince faction, to protect the second prince? Why does it need to be kept unnoticed by the second prince? To Monica's confusion, Louis continued his words without hesitation. As I mentioned earlier, His Highness Felix is currently attending Serendaya Academy a prestigious boarding school. So, in order to protect his highness without him noticing, well, it would be reasonable to infiltrate the school, but that school is under the control of the Duke of Crockford, so it would difficult. Duke Crockford, the maternal grandfather of the second prince, and was one of the most powerful men in the country and the leader of the second prince's faction. To put it simply, he and Louis were like water and oil. It was unlikely that Louis would cooperate to become his secret bodyguard. T then how are you going to protect him if you can't get into the school? That's why I've prepared him this magic tool for self-defense. Louis pulled a small cloth package from his pocket and placed it on the desk. Wrapped in a cloth was a shattered brooch. The large ruby in the center of the brooch was cracked and the finely crafted gold work on the clasp was cracked wide open. When Louis picked up the ruby, she noticed that there was a magic circle engraved on the base. The moment Monica saw the magic circle, she knew what it was. A a barrier consisting of danger detection, a small area of physical and magical protection, and a transmission. I'm impressed that you can see through it with just one glance. Yes. This is a magic tool for self-defense that I have painstakingly made. Magic tools are very useful for those who cannot use magic. It could be used just by adding mana to specially processed jewels and incorporating magic formulas. But, these items still considered as a very high class item, so it's not available in the current market. On top of that, it was made by the Seven Sages, the best magicians in this country, which made it can't be measured. In fact, even if it was inferior, it would be enough to buy two or three houses in the capital. Louis picked up a cracked ruby and looked through it at the sunlight streaming in through the window. Then, a magic circle appeared in the cracked ruby. I made this brooch in a pair, which is of sapphires and rubies. The holder of the sapphire brooch would get a protective barrier when they attacked. 
So I have asked His Majesty to make sure that His Highness Felix carries this brooch around with him. As such, Louis always kept the ruby brooch, the counterpart to the sapphire, close at hand to check for any danger to the prince. In the first place, Serendaya Academy itself was strictly controlled by Duke Crockford. Any malicious person who wanted to take the prince's life would not be able to easily break in. So, it's unlikely that this will happen very often, and Lewis seems to have had a high opinion of it. However, this magic tool, which I put my heart and soul into and worked tirelessly on for a week, broke down within three days of its completion. I in just three days. Yes, I heard that it shattered the day after His Majesty presented it to His Highness Felix. I had been working tirelessly for a week, but it took me three days to complete it. Well, when I saw the ruby brooch break, I laughed because it was so hilarious, ha ha ha. His laugh was incredibly strained, and his eyes were not smiling at all. No, it was no laughing matter, to begin with. The fact that the ruby brooch in Louis' hand was broken meant that the second prince was in some kind of danger. I is, the second prince, safe. When the magic tool was activated, I rushed to the school as soon as I could to check if anything had happened to His Highness, but His Highness was nonchalant and said nothing had happened. As for the breakage of the magic tool, he said it may have been a malfunction. In Lewis' hand, the ruby made a hard snapping sound. Fragments of the ruby spilled out from between his slender fingers. Scary. I don't believe something that I had created will have some defect. It's obvious that His Highness Felix was attacked by someone. However, His Highness Felix is hiding it. Things were finally starting to get a little fishy. She has a bad feeling about this. A very bad feeling. Louis scattered the shattered remains of the ruby on the desk and turned to Monica with a graceful smile that didn't match his ridiculous power. Well, now that I've said that, you should know what I'm about to say right. Monica shook her head as hard as she could. Her straw-like pigtails bobbed left and right. However, Louis just didn't care about Monica's attitude and said with a smile, Please do me a favor and go infiltrate the academy to protect His Highness. Despite sounding like he was asking for a handkerchief, what he was saying was a ridiculously difficult task. And then no way, TTT that's impossible? W-Y it has to be me. Why? Because of my popularity, it will get in the way. Look at my good looks. No matter how much I disguise myself, I can't hide it. On the other hand, you were never going out to social gatherings or ceremonies. Even when you did, you would always wear a hood and keep your head down, so your face is not known. And the most important is, Louis lifted Monica's chin with his slender fingertips, smiled enchantingly, and said, Nobody would think such plain little girl like you is one of the seven sages. What he said was a rant. Nero on the shelf said, Don't let him denounce you, give him a good scolding. Nero on the shelf spoke to her with his gaze, but Monica was too timid to retort, It's impossible. I, I've never been involved in protecting anyone before. That would be better. Huh. Monica's tears stopped for a moment at the unexpected words. Louis removed his fingers from Monica's chin and let out a sigh with a pensive look on his face. His Highness has very good intuition, you see, when I secretly put a person from the Magic Corps as an escort, he immediately saw right through him. His Highness has been surrounded by guards since a child, so he's quite adept at spotting them. That's why you are the best person for this job. Louis then looked straight at Monica and said with a refreshing smile. Even His Highness doesn't think that an amateurish little girl would be his personal guard. What's more, with your chantless spell, you can activate magic without being noticed, making you the perfect choice for his secret bodyguard. No, 
There is no one better suited for this job than you. What Lewis had said was making a lot of sense, but to Monica, it looked like Lewis was trying to throw a fit at the prince after his magic tool had been destroyed in just three days. She was probably right. After all, Lewis's eyes have been glittering with a dangerous glow for a while now. And that's the glow of a person who is really pissed off. Be but. I've never done a bodyguard job. I can't do it. When Monica desperately said that, Lewis tilted his head in a playful manner and looked at the stack of papers occupying the floor. Then he picked up the nearest piece and shook it with a pitter-patter. It's been almost two years since you and I became the Seven Sages. For the past two years, all you've done is stay indoors facing these paper. I.I.V.E. also, D. defeated, a dragon, three months ago. I have also defeated about 20 dragons in the past three months. So, although there was no clear hierarchy among the Seven Sages, Monica, and Louis, who had only been appointed for a short period of time, tended to be assigned chores by them. For the past two years, Lewis has mainly been sent out to kill dragons, while Monica has been in charge of the paperwork. Most of the documents in this cabin were things that the other seven sages had asked her to calculate for them. Lewis looked over the paper he'd picked up and squinted at it behind his spectacles. This document of Star's Orbit was the thing that Lady Star's Witch asked you, wasn't it? And this plant's fertilizer formula was from Lady Thorn Witch, this formula for calculating the coordinate axis for large-scale attack magic was from the Lord Artillery Magician, and these documents related to the purchase and inventory of the materials for the magic tools were from the Jewel Magician. Oh! Wasn't this one about Lord Abyssal Sorcerer's family's finances? You're even forced to do this chore. But, that was, our job. When Monica squirmed and objected, Lewis snorted haughtily. These are the work for an accounting or a bookkeeper. Listen, you are the seven sages, the top magicians in the Ridile Kingdom. Don't you think there is a job that only you can do? Don't you think so? You think don't you? You think? Just think. He emphasized the final sentence. As Monica shivered and wobbled, Lewis smiled and gave her a no-no. His majesty has entrusted me with the selection of the second prince's personal guard. In other words, you have no right of refusal, right, my dear friend? Be but. I think, someone who specialized at barriers like you, is the best person for this protection job. The idea of infiltrating the school of a prince, when the person in question is extremely bashful and shy, is beyond reckless. Let alone protecting the prince, she doesn't feel like she can spend her school life properly. When Monica desperately urged him to change his decision, Lewis patted Monica on the shoulder and looked into her face at very close range. Actually, I'm a newlywed. Yes. I want to get home as soon as possible for my lovely wife, so I don't want to add extra work. Now, do you understand? The pressure of his hand on Monica's shoulder grew stronger. I'm just asking you to show some consideration, little girl. His eyes glittered like razor blades, and Monica knew she could not escape. V1C3, things that trending nowadays. As Roth GT Silent Witch April 16, 2021 7 minutes. In a certain monastery in the eastern part of the Kingdom of Ridile, in the territory of Count Kerbeck, there was a poor girl who had no relatives. The former Countess Kerbeck saw in this poor girl a glimpse of her late husband and adopted her as her own daughter. That girl grew up happily and was loved by former Countess Kerbeck, however, she fell ill and died in her old age. After losing her guardian, that girl was ostracized by the people of the Count's family to serve her daughter as a servant. And then, when the daughter was enrolled in Serendaya Academy, a school for children of noble families, the pitiful girl was also sent to attend with her as her servant. 
And so, your role is to be this pitiful girl, Miss Monica. After Lewis blurted out such ridiculous background in earnest, Monica broke into a cold sweat and said in a faint voice, E excuse me, but I couldn't even understand any of your explanation. Honestly, to Monica, who barely understood most of it in her head, Lewis with a sly smile told her this. If you have this kind of troublesome background, nobody would bother to delve into it. Here is the book I used as a reference for. Behind Lewis, Lynn, who was dressed in a maid's uniform, smoothly took out a book. The author's name was Dustin Gunther. He has been Nero's favorite novelist lately. Lynn offered the book to Monica, then spoke to her in a respectful tone. This is a romance about a heroine who is bullied by Count's daughter, catches the attention of a prince, and eventually falls in forbidden love with him. Her insidious bullying tactics are very detailed and interesting. At Lynn's explanation, Nero on the shelf wagged his tail with a curious look on his face. There were several books by Dustin Gunther in this cabin, but they were all old. The book in Lynn's hands, on the other hand, was his latest work. It's no wonder Nero was interested in it. As Monica puzzled over the book, Lynn let her hold it gently. I will lend it to you. So feel free to use it as a reference. What kind of reference do you want her to take? Monica flipped through the pages of the book tentatively. When it comes to magic books, she can read for hours, but since she was not familiar with this kind of entertainment novel, she couldn't get the contents into her head. Flipping through the pages at random, she happened to find the scene where the heroine was crying in the shadows after her skirt was torn by a villainous daughter. The Count's daughter in the book was a very bad woman. Everything that she did was outrageous. Um, according to your idea, I'll be enrolled together with the daughter of Count Kerbeck, but this is... Oh, don't worry. I've told Count Kerbeck the details and have asked his only daughter, young Miss Isabel, to help. Monica turned her eyes away. Why you even went to trouble Count of the Kerbeck family? WW with those absurd backgrounds at that. At any rate, if the background Lewis had in mind were to be followed, Count Kerbeck and young Miss Isabel would have become the bad guys. To Monica's concern, Lewis said this with a relaxed attitude. Does the name of Count Kerbeck ring any bells? Huh? Um. Although Monica was quite skilled in calculating, she was not particularly good at remembering the names of people and places. Nevertheless, the word Count Kerbeck stuck in Monica's memory slightly. Ah, at the dragon extermination. That's right. The area where you defeated the Black Dragon of Wagon three months ago is the Count Kerbeck territory. The Count is deeply grateful to you. He even said he was willing to help in any way he could for the sake of Lady Silent Witch. Count Kerbeck was very grateful to the Silent Witch and had prepared a banquet to thank her for defeating the dragon. However, Monica had turned it down and had come back to this cabin to escape. Therefore, Monica had never met either Count Kerbeck or his daughter. Inwardly, Monica was scared. Her decision to leave the party might have offended him, but Count Kerbeck took it as how modest Lady Silent Witch is. I have already informed Count Kerbeck and his daughter about it. A are you talking about? T those backgrounds, where I'm an adopted daughter of a former countess, who is ostracized by the Count's family. Yes, exactly. When I told him about that background, Count Kerbeck was very excited saying, now, doesn't that sound like a ballad? H. He's excited. Speaking of which, young Miss Isabel's eyes were shining when she said, so this is the villainous daughter that has been trending these days. T. Trending. The novel that Lewis used as a reference book was apparently very popular in the royal capital. Being one of his biggest fans, Young Miss Isabel even went out her way to the capital in order to obtain the newest novel. 
In recent days, young Miss Isabel is working hard on her role as the villainess who bullies you. That's why you are going to infiltrate the school and work hard to protect the second prince while being bullied by young Miss Isabel. I mean, you're good at playing the role of the bullied girl, aren't you? Monica was unable to respond. It was because half of her mind had gone into unconsciousness. In fact, the moment Louis had obtained the cooperation of Count Kerbeck, he had no intention to let Monica escape. Once Louis and Lynn withdrew from the cabin, Monica was still slumped down on the floor in a daze. Louis had told her to pack her things because he would pick her up tomorrow at the same hour, but honestly, she had no idea where to start. Hey, Monica. Are you alive? Hello. While Monica was slumped over, Nero's paw tapped on her leg. Under normal circumstances, Monica would be comforted by the feel of those squishy paw pads, but she didn't have time for that now. What should I do? This is impossible. Going to the aristocrat's academy is scary. I have to be his bodyguard at that. I can't. Monica used to be enrolled in a school called Minerva, which was the best educational institution for magicians. In the past, noble families had a monopoly on the knowledge of spell casting, and even today, the majority of those who aspire to become magicians were children from noble families. Most of the time, it was the children of the second son or younger who were unable to take over the family. Hence, Children born commoners who wanted to become magicians were either used as errand boys or targeted for bullying by the noble families. And Monica was the latter. Monica, who was very shy and always nervous and timid, was easy prey for such things. Especially after she was able to use chantless spell, things had gone badly, with jealousy and envy mixed in. That's why Monica spent a lot of time in the laboratory of the professor who always took care of her, and devoted herself to the study of spell casting. Monica had graduated from Minerva at the age of 15, but she had spent most of her final year holed up in her lab, not attending classes. If her professor hadn't recommended her as one of the seven sages, she would probably still be holed up in her lab. Well, even though she has become the seven sages, she's still holed up in her cabin like this. I can't. I can't do this. What should I do, Nero? How about running away? At Nero's suggestion, Monica wobbled and shook her head, almost squirming. I I will be, K killed. I if I do that. You sure he's going to go that far? What was his name again? Run Run Luauesis. Nero, if you call his name like that, he would turn you into cat soup. Monica covered her face with her hands and hung her head down. Lewis Miller, the barrier magician, was a pretty young man with quite an aristocratic demeanor, but he was also one of the most accomplished combat magicians in the country. Monica knew that underneath those white gloves there was a magnificent punching arm. If I run away... Lewis will definitely chase me to the ends of the earth. Is that guy really a human? Are you not mistaken about him being a keeper of the underworld rather than the seven sages? That's how scary he is. Monica knew that there was no way out for her anymore. Even so, she was afraid. While Monica sniffled, Nero wagging his tail and suggested, Let's look on the bright side. You're going to be the prince's bodyguard. He's the prince, you see. He must be cool, right? He must be sparkling, right? And every female human loves such a prince, right? I don't know. As the seven sages, you should have attended some kind of ceremony or something, no? Then, you must have seen the prince's face before. Monica shook her head loosely. Monica who was very shy and uncomfortable in crowded places, usually kept her head down with her robe pulled over her head during the ceremony and kept her breath down until the ceremony was over. She's not even got a good look at the king's face on the throne. Say, Monica. 
I was just thinking. Not knowing the face of the second prince you're guarding is rather fatal, isn't it? What should I do now? Honestly, had she said that she didn't know what the second prince looked like, Lewis Miller would probably give her a beautiful smile, shove a fist into Monica's head, and hurl all the abusive language he could think of at her. Imagining that scene, Monica collapsed onto the floor and broke down in hollow tears. V1C4, Bullying the Strong As Roth GT Silent Witch April 17, 2021 8 minutes TLN, I changed the term Lidile to Ridile. Lewis Miller, the barrier magician, who had forced Monica to work as a bodyguard for the second prince, was staying in a village near the cabin where Monica lived. After all, it would take a whole day to get from this village to the capital by carriage. Lewis exhaled a sigh, I can't wait to get back to my home where my beloved wife awaits. It wasn't that he didn't like to eat in a public restaurant, but he didn't want to stand out too much right now, so he had his meals brought to a private room at the inn. Across the table, his contracted spirit, Lynn, was quietly reading a book. She was a spirit with no sense of taste, so she can't accompany him to eat. The cool beauty in the maid's uniform was reading a book expressionlessly, but eventually closed the book with a snap and opened her mouth. Lord Lewis, I have a question. What is it? I'm still eating. Why did you ask Miss Silent Witch to guard the second prince? Lewis was expecting a question about the content of the book, so he narrowed his eyes a little and wiped his mouth with a napkin. Give me your view, Lindsbergfield. In my opinion, Lord Lewis, after the magic tool you put so much effort into making was destroyed in three days, you were so angry that you tried to vent your anger by taking it out on the weak-minded person, which is Miss Silent Witch. What kind of a man do you think your master is? I have heard that he has character disorder who likes to bully the weak. Without a moment's hesitation, his contracted spirit said this to him, and Lewis was smiling with a furrowed temple. Bring the person who blurted out that assessment to you here. I will trample him thoroughly until his head sinks into the floor. That person was your mentor, Lord Gideon Rutherford. His mentor, Gideon Rutherford was one of the few people he can't handle even for the proud Lewis. Lewis clicked his tongue ungracefully and shook his head in a dramatic gesture. His neat face had a sad expression on it, but his earlier remark had ruined everything. Oh, how lamentable. People have been misunderstanding about me. The word misunderstanding that Lewis said to Lynn was said in a stern manner. It is always more fun to bully the strong than to bully the weak, isn't it? The idea was too far-fetched. Above all, he's not denying the part of his character disorder. Lynn tilted her head with a blank expression. In the book she had just read, all the characters who had been questioned had tilted their heads in this way. This gesture, which she was simply copying, combined with her expressionless face, made her look like a doll with a broken neck. Lord Lewis, when you were bullying me, silent witch, you had the face of a scumbag who enjoys bullying the weak. You say Miss Silent Witch is weak? Who are you talking about? Lewis snorted at Lynn's rebuttal as if it were a mockery. He gave her a graceful smile, but the eyes behind his spectacles shine brightly and somewhat belligerently. In the past, I've been completely defeated by such a little girl in the magic battle of the Seven Sages selection. At that time, Lewis Miller has more experience as a commander of the Magical Corps, specializing in fighting with spell casting. Having defeated many dragons and buried more than a hundred of them, he was one of the top two combatant magicians in the country. But, in a magic battle, he was totally defeated by the Silent Witch who was 15 years old. I, Lewis Miller, the barrier magician, assure you, that one's a monster. Lewis emphatically proclaimed that such a little girl, who couldn't make eye contact with people, 
always kept her head down and was scared out of her wits, was a monster. Lewis laced his fingers together, rested his thin chin on it, and squinted. His Majesty ordered me to secretly protect the second prince, but I can't just take His Majesty's words literally. What do you mean? Keep a close eye on the second prince, that's what I believe His Majesty meant. The second prince has always been an excellent person. He has excellent academic and swordsmanship skills, and even though he was still attending school, his high diplomatic skills have earned him the trust and confidence of both domestic and foreign nobles. Above all, his beautiful appearance and gentle smile, inherited from his mother, have been reputed to charm the people who saw him. He managed everything without a hitch and was very good at controlling people's minds. He, whose grandfather was Duke Crockford, the most powerful noble in the country, was Felix Arkridial. But no one knows his true nature. Underneath his friendly, soft smile, there was something horrible stirring. That was the kind of creepy feeling Lewis sensed in Felix. However, whenever Lewis tried to find out what the discomfort was, Felix always smoothly fend him off with a soft smile. The second prince is a very shrewd predator. Using a straightforward manner won't make him back down. That's why Lewis chose Monica as his helpers. That girl who has a freakish talent that didn't match with her shy personality had made everything look a little out of place. I've told you. I like to pick on the strong. So what you want to say is, you want to bully both the second prince and Miss Silent Witch at the same time, which are belong to the strong ones. Without correcting her, Lewis just gave her a beautiful smile. It was such a beautiful smile that most women would be charmed by, and it was no less than the second prince, but Lynn was not particularly impressed and said matter-of-factly, I understand. I will revise my assessment of you to the person with personality disorder who likes to bully the strong dot. You should also correct the part about the personality disorder. The story was set back two days before Monica Everett, the silent witch, broke down in tears after being forced into a task to protect the second prince. In the dormitory room of Serendaya Academy, one of the most prestigious schools in the Ridile Kingdom, Felix Ark Ridile, the second prince of the Ridile Kingdom, leaned back on the couch and lazily watched as his chamberlain unwrapped a gift. The gift was wrapped in a package with the royal family's crest. In other words, the gift was a gift from his father, His Majesty the King. However, the look Felix gave to the gift wrapping was cold. Aside from Felix, the only person in the room was a young man who was his chamberlain. He took out a silk-wrapped brooch from a package, inspected it, and respectfully presented it to Felix. What kind of occasion this time? It's a gift for your advancement to the higher grade. Oh. Muttering without much interest, Felix picked up the brooch with his gloved hand and held it up to the light. Looking through the light of the large sapphire in the center of the ring, one can see the faintest hint of magical writing behind the royal blue. As I thought, it was a magic tool. Will, do you know what kind of magic formula is built into it? Felix then placed the brooch in his hand onto the hand of the chamberlain behind him. The young man, a chamberlain called Will, flickered his very light blue eyes to see the magic formula in the sapphire. I believe this magic tool had contained a defensive barrier to protect you, your highness. Are that the only effect it has? Actually, there are other formulas built into this. Perhaps, when the defensive barrier is triggered, it will transmit His Highness's current location to some remote location. When Will explained this, Felix brushed his honey blonde hair lightly and let out a sigh with a very annoyed look on his face. That would be a problem. It would be terrible if it was accidentally triggered in the middle of my night activities. So let's do this. Felix pinned the brooch to Will's chest. 
He then pulled out a self-defense sword from under the bed and swung it straight at the head of the bewildered Chamberlain standing there. A white layer of light formed between Will, whose eyes were wide and rigid, and the sword Felix swung down, which caught the sword. Once the layer of light disappeared, the sapphire on Will's chest cracked with a soft snap. Oh, so this is how it works. Felix put away his sword, muttering in a voice that didn't seem to be interested in it at all. Will removed the broken brooch from his chest and took the cracked sapphire off its pedestal. The pedestal was engraved with a very detailed magic formula. This is a combination of advanced barrier formula. It's not something that an ordinary magician can create. I think only Lewis Miller, the barrier magician, can create something like this. Oh, of the seven sages, Felix recalled Lewis Miller belonged to the first prince faction. Why did the king give Felix a magic tool made by Lewis Miller of the first prince faction as a gift for his advancement? Come to think of it, there were some members of the magical corps mixed in among the cafeteria staff and the janitors. I guess they're one of Lewis Miller's pawns. Would you like me to dispose of them? Yeah, just make sure it's taken care of properly. I'm sure they call it protection, but, if they start sniffing around too much, let them know they're making an enemy of the House of Crockford. This school was under the power of Felix's grandfather, the Duke of Crockford. Even His Majesty the King can't interfere easily. That's probably why the King decided to send Lewis Miller. Felix snatched the brooch from Will's hand and rolled it around in his hand with a faint smile. Looks like His Majesty have been keeping eye on me. Then please refrain from playing around at night those were the words that Will never said to him. To Will, Felix was his master, and that's for sure. So, even if his master had pinned a magic tool brooch with no idea how effective it would be, and had swung his sword down on him, he would never complain. Felix sat back down on the couch and gracefully crossed his legs, tossing the shattered sapphire onto the table in a careless manner. Looks like this one was defective. I will inform that to his majesty. Will picked up the remnants of the brooch and rewrapped it. Watching this unfold, Felix let out a small sigh. He then pulled off his scarf and loosened his collar. The white nape of his neck was exposed, revealing the red remnants of his night's affair. I'm still sleepy after having returned late yesterday. I will take a nap. Wake me up when it's time for the tea party. Miss Bridget's holding a tea party today, and it would be troublesome if I ditched her. Without waiting for Will's response, Felix closed his eyes. As for Will, he bowed and said certainly, then began silently collecting the pieces of the brooch again. V1C5, Teacher Lewis, not. Fun lesson about nobility. As Roth GT Silent Witch April 18th, 2021 6 minutes. TLN, I'm not very knowledgeable about these noble titles slash ranks. So if you found any incorrect terms, please feel free to comment below. As the carriage rattled along, Lewis looked at Monica sitting across from him and opened his mouth. The first question, please answer in order from top to bottom the rank of nobility in our kingdom. B. Baron, Marquis, Duke, Earl. As Monica replied unsurely, Lewis gave her a beautiful smile and called her a stupid girl. Not only does none of it correct, but also, where did the Viscount go? He n. Now, in the carriage, Lewis was giving a brief lecture about nobility. Even though the lecture was covered on nobility, he didn't teach her how their manner or behaving. In fact, before teaching her some manners, he would teach her some general knowledge. And the whole thing started with a simple question from Monica. We will now head to my house in the royal capital. There, we will meet up with the daughter of Count Kerbeck, young Miss Isabel Norton, to complete the admission procedures. After getting into the carriage, Louis explained to Monica what they were going to do. 
However, Monica was more interested in what Lewis was saying than what he was doing. This time, Isabel Norton, the daughter of Count Kerbeck, will be Monica's collaborator. Um, I thought Kerbeck was a family name. Excuse me. Monica said that while fidgeted with her fingers to Lewis, who looked as if he didn't understand what she was saying. Well, I thought her name was Isabel Kerbeck because she was the daughter of Count Kerbeck. Kerbeck is their title. Those who have a title above Count usually referred to by their title. When Monica's eyes went blank, Lewis felt his cheeks twitching. My colleague, how much do you know about the nobility? Monica shook her head mutely, and the smile finally disappeared from Lewis's face. Thus began Teacher Lewis, not, fun lesson on nobility. The first thing to do is to get this into your head. In our kingdom, the ranks of nobility are, in order from the top, Duke, Marquis, Count, Viscount, and Baron. There are also quasi-aristocrats below these, but I won't go into that here. In any case, if you encounter a Duke-class person, just consider him or her to be related to the royal family. With Lewis's words etched in her mind, Monica blurted out, Count is a surprisingly high position, isn't it? To tell the truth, Monica had thought that the lowest rank of nobility was Count. At Monica's murmur, Lewis opened his eyes to the limit and stared at Monica as if he were looking at something incredible. My colleague, you have your own title, don't you? The seven sages were granted a special status of the Count of Magic, which was equivalent to the rank of Count. In other words, Monica was a member of the nobility and was also one of the few women in the kingdom that held a title of nobility, but, for the past two years, Monica has been cooped up in her cabin, unaware of her status as a member of the nobility. Thinking back, she did remember receiving proof of peerage, a ring, and other things when she became one of the seven sages, but she couldn't remember where she had put them. It was probably buried somewhere in a stack of papers in her cabin. When Monica honestly confessed that, Lewis brushed his fingers over the crease between his eyebrows and exhaled deeply. To start with, let's talk about counts. In general, a count who owns a territory receives their title directly from that territory. For example, Lord Azure Norton is Count Kerbeck, who rules over the territory of Count Kerbeck. This also applies to dukes and marquises. Are there some counts who have no territory? There are. Or rather, we are the ones, you stupid girl. Counts who did not have their own territories were referred to as Count Palatine. And the Count of Magic was one of them. In the case of a Count who doesn't have a territory, you might add Count to their family name. In your case, you will be called Count Everett. Even people born as commoners can receive a peerage depending on their achievements. Among them, it would not be an exaggeration to say that the Count of Magic is the highest position they could achieve. To be honest, there are many different types of a Count. There are those who are on the verge of downfall and are living the same life as commoners. They may have the same title as a Count, but their influence is very different. Among such a Count, the Count of Magic was said to have a very high position. After all, the seven sages were in a position where they could directly express their opinions to His Majesty the King. However, Monica has never met the King outside of ceremonies. This was because Monica, who was basically cooped up in her mountain cabin, was absent from most of the meetings of the seven sages where the King would occasionally show up. In principle, the seven sages were not obliged to show up at social gatherings, but since magical research would need patrons, the overwhelming majority of the seven sages actively involved in the social circles. A shut-in like Monica was a rarity. The Count of Magic is relatively influential among the Counts, but it is a non-heredity title that holds no territory. Once you step down as one of the seven sages, you lose your title. 
That's why everyone is so eager to maintain their position. Are you too like that, Louis? Isn't that obvious? Louis answered immediately and looked at Monica with sharp, grimacing eyes. I have no intention of throwing away my current position. That's why I have to make sure this secret mission succeeds. In the midst of the rattling carriage, Louis stretched out his arm without losing his balance and placed his finger perfectly between Monica's eyes. Failure is not an option, my colleague. That one word had nailed Monica who was not attached to her position as Count of Magic in her coffin. If Monica failed to protect the prince, it would also be a failure for Louis. If that happens, what will Louis do to her is something she doesn't want to see. Just thinking about it makes me want to throw up. As Monica turned pale and held her stomach, Louis said, Oh, are you getting carriage sickness, in a concerned tone. By the time Monica and her group arrived at Louis' mansion in the royal capital after an early morning carriage ride, the sun of summer was beginning to set a little. After a long ride in the carriage and being drilled with knowledge about the nobility by Louis, Monica was walking unsteadily behind him. If it weren't for Lynn's support to assist her, she would have fallen to the ground long ago. Rosalie, I'm back. As soon as Lewis said this in a hearty voice, his wife, Rosalie Miller, immediately greeted the group. Welcome home. Compared to the gorgeous Lewis, she seemed to be a rather modest-looking woman. She wore simple clothes with few ornaments, and her dark brown hair was tied up in a single bun. Unlike Louis, who was expressing with every fiber of his being that he missed his wife, Rosalie's attitude was nonchalant. When Louis dropped a kiss on Rosalie's cheek, she didn't move an eyebrow and stared at Monica. She is. Like me, she is the seven sages of the silent witch, Miss Monica Everett. Rosalie was a bit taken aback, looking at Monica. She was too young to be the Seven Sages, but more than that, Monica's outfit was probably the reason why she was so surprised. With her small, skinny body, worn-out robe, and shaggy pigtails, she could be mistaken for a vagrant if she were not dressed properly. However, Rosalie quickly straightened up and bowed to Monica. My deepest apologies, Lady Silent Witch. I'm Rosalie Miller, wife of the barrier magician, Louis Miller. Please allow me to thank you for the care you've given my husband. PLPLE please. T to meet, why you? Monica also hurriedly bowed her head, but she could barely manage to say this in a strained voice. As a shy person, greeting new people was always something that Monica had a hard time doing with. When she was bowing in a stiff manner, Louis grabbed Monica by the scruff of her neck and forced her to look up. Rosalie, I apologize for coming home so early, but, could you please turn back this into a human being? I I am a human. At Monica's rebuttal in a mosquito-like voice, Louis snickered as he grabbed Monica by her scruff. Do you know, my colleague? Right now, you look like a straw doll in rags. If you were to stand in a wheat field, you would surely be mistaken for a scarecrow. That's so mean. When Monica was sniffling, Louis gave her a cold look and said, If you have a problem with that, why don't you evolve into a human being and come back later? I have no interest in questioning a scarecrow. V1C6, please don't forget about your familiar. As Roth GT Silent Witch April 19th, 2021 5 minutes. Lady Everett. Whyish. When Lewis's wife, Rosalie, called out to her, it took Monica about 20 seconds to respond. Not accustomed to being called Lady Everett, had made her response delayed, and by the time she realized her response was late, she couldn't figure out the right timing when she should reply, but since Rosalie was still silently waiting for her, she thought she had to reply, so she gathered up all her courage, but only resulted into that response. It's so embarrassing that she just wants to die. However, 
Rosalie did not make fun of Monica's attitude and said calmly, Excuse me, but may I ask how old you are? Er, um, I, I am 17 years old. You are older than me, so you don't have a tach lady to call me. In the meantime, Rosalie stared at mumbling Monica. The way of how she watched Monica was like inspecting something rather than looking down at a shabby girl. After that, she brushed up Monica's bangs, which had been left untended. I'll gladly take your word. Well then, excuse me, Miss Everett. Rosalie then abruptly pulled Monica's lower eyelids downward. Monica blinked in surprise, but a quiet voice of don't move urged her to be still. Furthermore, Rosalie instructed her to open her mouth to check her oral cavity and inspected her entire body, down to her hands and nails. No abnormalities in eye movement, no gingival bleeding. However, your underside lower eyelids are white, and your nails are also white. There are other symptoms that include dry skin, low body weight inappropriate for age. You're showing symptoms of malnutrition and anemia. How many hours did you sleep per day? At Rosalie's inquiry, Monica turned over and fidgeted, kneading her fingers. After living in a cabin and doing a lot of calculations, Monica never had a definite bedtime. Since the seven sages had a good income and didn't need to conserve candle and lamp oil, they often spent most of their time facing the numbers until their bodies reached their limits and lost consciousness. Um, my sleeping time is always random. How many times do you eat in a day? How much food do you eat in general? I eat some nuts when I'm hungry. I sometimes eat some biscuits. In any case, she wouldn't go to bed or eat until her body told her she was at her limit. She always ate only the minimum amount of food that could satisfy her hunger, because she felt sleepy when she was full. When Rosalie found out about Monica's current situation, she proceeded to ask her if she had had any serious illnesses in the past or had any food allergies. After several repetitions of Monica's slurred answers and Rosalie's repeated questions, Rosalie ended her questioning and called for Lynn. A high-ranking spirit in a maid's uniform quickly appeared at Rosalie's call. It was much more swift than when she was in front of her master, Louis. Did you call me, Lady Rosalie? We have a pot of soup in the oven. Can you please reheat it for me? Also, I need you to soak a piece of bread in some warm milk over low heat. Yes, ma'am. As Lynn bowed and walked away, Rosalie turned to Monica and rolled up her sleeves. Rosalie drove Monica's shoulders and led her to the bathroom, while Monica was freaking out about what she was going to do. In order to turn you into a human being, all you need to do now is to eat and sleep enough. But first, you need to take a bath. Keeping your body clean is fundamental for maintaining a healthy body. Rosalie then ruthlessly stripped Monica threw her in the bathroom, and scrubbed her all over. She also trimmed her hair, which she had been letting grow long, saying, if you let your hair get into your eyes, it can cause eye disease. There is no hesitation or reservation in her movement. When Monica had changed into Rosalie's old clothes, Louis, who had been absent for a long time, showed up. Now, don't you look a lot more human? That's quite a statement. As Monica's mouth agape, Rosalie, who was combing Monica's hair, glared at Louis. Despite being a woman, her eyes are sharp and filled with unusual intensity. I can't believe you have the gall to bring a patient like this before me, Louis Miller. There's no way I'm letting such a little girl in a need leave like that. When Rosalie mentioned the word patient, Monica insisted in a muffled voice, I'm healthy. However, Rosalie asserted sharply, anyone who looks at you now will regard you as an unhealthy person. Husband has their way of talking, it was also for a wife. They were not very much alike, but they do have a similar way of speaking. 
When Monica opened and closed her mouth, Louis glanced at her and said, Rosalie is a doctor, so you'd better listen to what she says, my colleague. Indeed, the way she looked at Monica was like that of a doctor examining a patient's condition. Rosalie was a quiet woman, but she had the stubbornness of a doctor who would not let a patient say no to her. And now, Monica has been identified as a patient by her. The best way to treat her is to improve her diet and sleep schedule. Just at that moment, Lynn brought in the food for the three of them and laid it on the table. It was a simple meal of bread, salad, roasted duck, and soup, but for Monica's portion, her bread was stewed in milk and the meat was chopped into small pieces. Don't force yourself to eat everything. It's okay to eat small amounts at a time. Just make sure to eat everything in a balanced way. Why yes. Both the soup and the bread stewed in milk had a light flavor but were delicious. It had been a long time since she had eaten a warm meal. Monica tended to forget about eating when she was absorbed in her calculations, and the same could be said for eating. When she is absorbed in eating, she tended to forget about other things. Anyway, she would concentrate on eating until the plate in front of her was empty. That's why I always keep it simple. When she had emptied her plate in a frenzy, Rosalie said, Well done, and placed a small plate of dessert in front of Monica. And it was a cherry pie, but there are none for Louis. Rosalie, where's mine? Glancing at Monica, who was engrossed in her cherry pie, Louis voiced his discontent. Rosalie chided as she placed a cup of after-dinner tea in front of Louis. You've been taking in too much sugar. I bet you put a lot of jam and sugar in your tea when you were out. At least, you need to cut down on your sugar at home. With that, Rosalie moved the sugar pot away from Louis. Louis shook his head sadly and pulled out a small bottle from his pocket. The bottle was labeled as alcohol. When Louis about to pour the high alcohol into his cup of tea, Rosalie quickly took the bottle from him. And no more alcohol for you. Geez, you took my sugar and now my alcohol too, then what will I have left to enjoy in life? I'm your wife and also a doctor. So you'd better listen to what I say, honey. Louis, who had been told exactly what he had just said to Monica, fell silent and drank his tea without sugar with a sullen face. It was a rare sight to see the haughty Louis being put in his place, but Monica, engrossed in her pie, was oblivious to the scene. As a side note, the thought of Nero starving in her bag never crossed her mind at all. V1C7, the villainous daughter loves the silent witch. As Roth GT silent witch April 20th, 2021 7 minutes. Lewis soaked Monica's light brown hair with a thin layer of fragrant oil and combed it with great care. Listen, beauty is not something you can achieve in a day. It takes time and effort to achieve. Serendaya Academy was built for the children of noble families. So wearing something too shabby will make you look bad. After doing her hair, Louis took out another cream and smeared it on Monica's skin. Monica was now at his mercy, feeling as if she were a doll. Keep your skin and hair moisturized? That's the most important thing. I will provide you with perfumes and creams separately, so apply them every day before going to bed. Understand? Why yes. Monica replied in a faint voice as her cheek was needed. He was very thorough in his commitment to beauty. He was a man with a figure so beautiful that he could be mistaken for a woman. He was supposed to be in his late twenties, but he looked much younger than that. Such beauty of his was evidently the result of his daily care. Louis, you look more woman than a real woman. Just as she blurted out what was on her mind, the hand that had been smearing cream on Monica's cheek deepened into her face with a crunch. It hurts. Louis had a cold smile on his beautiful feminine face that almost sent chills down her spine. My colleague, let me tell you something good. I hate it to death when people say that I look like a woman. 
Do you want to know what happened to the idiot who said it before? The hand that grasped Monica's face was filled with strength. Monica shuddered in fear as her skull squeezed together. I'm... I'm sorry, Yai. I, I won't say it again. I'm glad you've been so understanding. Louis took his hands away from Monica's face and put the bottle of fragrant oil and cream in her hands. Don't neglect to take care of it properly, you hear me. With that, Louis smiled at her. His smile was more beautiful than most women's, but also more intimidating than a dragon's. Three days had passed since Monica had been staying at Louis Miller's house. The reason she did not immediately sneak into the school was to wait for the arrival of the daughter of Count Kerbeck. Their territory was located near the border and it would take about three days to reach the royal capital. While awaiting her arrival, Monica was thoroughly drilled in her understanding of Serendaya Academy and some manners of the nobility by Louis, while Rosalie instructed her on regular diet and sleep. Not that things had changed drastically in just three days, but her complexion, which according to Louis looked like a dead person, seemed to have gotten much better. It took her a while to get used to the idea of sleeping at night, but once the candles and lamps were confiscated, it left her nothing to do, so she slept instead. As for her familiar, Nero, he spent his daytime hours reading a book in the corner of her room. Apparently, he borrowed his favorite author's novels from Lynn. Nero dexterously flipped through the pages of a romance novel with his cat's paw, and when in the mood, he would stroll aimlessly around the mansion. And today, too, after having eaten lunch, Nero would go for another walk to relieve his stomach, but when he suddenly returned, he spoke to Monica under the watchful eyes of Louis and the others. Monica? There's some kind of awesome roll coming. Awesome, roll. It's an orange roll. What was exactly an orange roll? To Monica's puzzlement, Lynn approached Monica quietly. Miss Monica, the daughter of Count Kerbeck, Lady Isabel Norton, your collaborator in this infiltration operation of Serendaya Academy, has arrived. Oh ho ho ho, good day everyone. The one who greeted Monica with a high-pitched laugh that could be heard throughout the mansion was a girl of Monica's age. She was wearing a crimson dress embroidered with luxurious gold threads. Her light orange hair was shaped in magnificent roll, and it appeared that Nero was referring to her ringlet hair. As Monica stood in front of the door, feeling overwhelmed, Young Miss Isabel Norton put a fan to her mouth and looked at Monica with a mean look in her eyes. Oh, my, a very good day to you, Aunt Monica. You look as poorly dressed as ever. The fact that you are the youngest member of Quebec's family makes me ashamed of myself. Monica stood there, pale from the clear hostility that was being thrown at her. Feeble-minded Monica was sensitive to the malice of others. Even the slightest stinging words can make her shrink. The clear malicious words already brought tears to Monica's eyes. But before Monica could even cower in place, Miss Isabel smiled at her with a triumphant look. How does it look now? Did I sound like a villainess? I've been practicing my voice every single day since I was given this role. I'm confident nobody can beat the sharpness of my high-pitched laugh. What does the sharpness of a high-pitched laugh mean, she wondered. When she saw Monica's eyes darted around in disbelief, young Miss Isabel huffed as if she realized something. Oh my, how embarrassing, I haven't even introduced myself. Then young Miss Isabel pinched the hem of her skirt and made the graceful and beautiful courtesy of a noblewoman. It is a pleasure to meet you, Lady Monica Everett of the Silent Witch. My name is Isabel Norton, daughter of Azure Norton of Count Kerbeck. Thank you very much for your help in defeating the Black Dragon. Please allow me to express my gratitude on behalf of my father and my people. Young Miss Isabel smiled at Monica, who was so shocked that she turned into a sculpture. 
It's a very cute, friendly, and loving smile with no hint of malice. Oh, I had never imagined that the seven sages, who single-handedly shot down a pack of over ten wyverns, and even defeated the legendary black dragon of Wagon, were so adorable? I had heard that you are only one year older than I am. One year difference means she must be eighteen years old, thought young Miss Isabel in the corner of her mind before she took Monica's hand and looked into Monica's face with rosy cheeks. May I call you big sister Monica? She was younger than she expected. E.R., um, Louis, who had been smiling watching this exchange on the couch stood up and forced Monica to lower her head. Come on, Miss Silent Witch, Isabel will be working with you from now on, so why don't you greet her? P.L.E. please, take care, off. Lewis kept Monica's head down and let out a sigh of exasperation when Monica choked on her words. I apologize, Lady Isabel. She is a bit of a shy person. Oh, please, I don't mind. I know big sister Monica is a shy person, but she is stronger, more tender-hearted, and braver than anyone else. Who could that be? Monica wondered. At least she's not a very strong or brave person. But young Miss Isabel seemed to be completely trapped in her own world, and with her hands on her rosy cheeks, she looked up into the air enraptured and began to speak. The black dragon of Wagon was said to be difficult to kill even for the dragon knights. Its flames which originated from flames of the underworld can burn through anything and everything, even nullifying the defensive barriers of magicians. It was the strongest, most vicious dragon of all. Exterminating it single-handedly is not something anyone can do especially when she left the place without saying a word after slaying the black dragon, it was so dreamy. In fact, the only reason why Monica joined in the fight against the black dragon was, she was told by Louis, why don't you exercise once in a while, before dragged out by grabbing her neck. It was not out of modesty that she did not participate in the party, but out of shyness. However, to young Miss Isabel, who was unaware of such circumstances, Monica appeared to be a brave and humble great magician. This was a huge misunderstanding, but Monica wasn't eloquent enough to explain it, and for Louis, he was trying to make use of the misunderstanding to the best of his advantage. Big Sis Monica? I've heard you've been assigned as a secret bodyguard to protect His Highness Felix this time? I'm honored to be able to help you with that. In order to prevent you from being suspected, I will put my utmost effort to bully you. So please rest assured and give your whole attention to protecting His Highness. After saying that, young Miss Isabel took Monica's hand and shook it upside down. Completely swept up in the atmosphere, Monica was left to her own devices and could only say in a faint voice, Yes. While young Miss Isabel clung to Monica in excitement, Louis smiled kindly and distanced himself slightly from them. There, a beautiful woman in a maid's uniform, Lynn, approached and asked him a question. Two members of the magical corps who had infiltrated Serendaya Academy have been discovered by His Highness and kicked out of the academy. What an astute prince, Louis thought, clicking his tongue soundlessly. He had sent out some members of the Magical Corps in case they were needed, but he hadn't expected them to see through him so quickly. With Monica and young Miss Isabel about to enter the school, it was inevitable that the second prince would be suspicious of them. Although there was no direct connection between Count Kerbeck and Louis, it should raise no small amount of suspicion in the second prince. These two people could be Louis Miller's minions or so he thought. We need someone to act as a diversion. And, who could it be? I will enroll my foolish disciple at the same time as Miss Monica and Lady Isabel are enrolled here. A grin crept onto Lewis's face, and his eyes glinted sharply behind one pair of glasses. That way, His Highness' suspicions will undoubtedly be directed on him, won't they? 
Speaking of his disciples, he had once destroyed half of the school building of Minerva, an institution for training magicians. So, Monica Everett, the silent witch, a girl who has a problem with interpersonal skills. Lady Isabel, who has been playing the role of a villainess for her. And a disciple of Lewis Miller, who once had a record of destroying a school building. With these three misfits being admitted at the same time, Lynn secretly wondered how quickly Serendaya Academy would collapse. Two months, I'd guess. What are you saying out of the blue, you stupid?